Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. know we have a lot of issues in our state. The push for candidates to address those issues instead of dishing rhetoric. I'm hoping that they'll just remember it as a fair person. Retiring Senate President John Alario Jr. looking back at nearly 50 years in politics. I never imagined I would be a professional opera singer. How Paul Groves used his voice to carry Louisiana's culture for the arts around the world. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first to look at other news making headlines across Louisiana. Congressman Garrett Graves this week announced a $5.3 million federal grant to pay for the elevation of 88 homes in Livingston Parish overcome by high water in the 2016 flood. Graves says we are getting to the good part now with progress being made to make us stronger. He's referring to waterways being cleared, construction underway for the diversion canal, and properties being elevated. The company that won a multi-million dollar flood recovery contract only to see the deal canceled because of conflict of interest concerns will be allowed to compete again for the work. The bidding process will be redone, allowing Hunt, Geo and Associates, or HGA, and two other losing bidders to submit updated contract proposals. Republican candidate for governor Ralph Abraham has launched his first TV ad. The third term congressman does not speak in the 32nd spot. Narrators describe him as an ally of President Donald Trump and the GOP frontrunner against Democrat incumbent John Bell Edwards. It never mentions fellow Republican contender Eddie Rispone. The ad ends with the words, help is on the way. Governor Edwards says the state is working on lease extensions with the New Orleans Saints designed to keep the NFL club in the Superdome for up to 30 additional years. Edwards says lease talks are happening in conjunction with extensive and needed Superdome renovations. Renovations could take up to four years and cost half a billion dollars. The club's existing lease expires in 2025. Saints quarterback Drew Brees has joined the governor in promoting the state's new program to certify veteran-owned businesses. A new public service TV announcement will air during the run-up to the October 12th elections. Lawmakers agreed this year to create the Veterans First Business Initiative alongside economic development. The state made a tiny dent in the number of state-created boards and commissions, but spending on them continues to rise. Legislative Auditor Daryl Papura's office released its annual report and found five fewer boards from the year before, but also found spending had increased $300,000. A group of state lawmakers has had little success in their efforts to substantially reduce the number of boards and commissions. The U.S. Small Business Administration has made low-interest loans available to those affected by tornadoes and severe storms this past April in North Louisiana. Six parishes, Bienville, Claiborne, Jackson, Lincoln, Washita, and Union, are eligible. Businesses and private nonprofits can borrow up to $2 million and homeowners up to $200,000. Vandals trashed parts of Baton Rouge's African American History Museum sometime this week. Photos posted online showed flipped benches, windows on the ground, and torn and ruined landscaping. The damage happened exactly one month after its beloved founder was murdered. Police discovered the body of 75-year-old Sadie Roberts Joseph in the trunk of her car, and they arrested a suspect. Her son Jason called the vandalism disrespectful and extremely disappointing. The museum has been closed since her death.
Moving into the fall elections, there is a nonpartisan push for candidates to address the real issues. With nicknames like Sportsman's Paradise and the Big Easy touting the abundant good life in Louisiana and the carefree attitude of our largest city, it's a bit jarring to see national rankings year in, year out that give a far different picture of the place we call home. U.S. News & World Report annually gives a documented research review of where things are good and where things are bad across America, and Louisiana continues to rank dead last when it comes to education, health care, crime, and opportunity for its people. This year, as in 2018, we ranked 50th among the country's 50 states considered in the ranking, which weighs data on a range of quality of life measures. The best state honor went to Washington, which earned high marks for its booming economy, investment in renewable energy, and strong public education. Governor Edwards was critical of Louisiana's last place ranking, which he said relies on old data and fails to capture recent gains made in the state. The governor said the ranking does not accurately reflect the progress made in recent years. But a trio of government watchdog groups say the numbers are hard to argue with. They urge candidates to reset the conversation. I sat down with Barry Irwin, the head of one of those groups, Council for a Better Louisiana. Barry, the focus of reset is to move Louisiana's election year conversation from political rhetoric to policy ideas and ideas and things that are truly impacting us. Absolutely. I mean, look, we know we have a lot of issues in our state. We know we need to address them. Political campaigns or political election years are the times where we have an opportunity to have our voice heard and, and talked about on those things. But we also know that campaigns don't always really want to talk about those issues that are important. We get distracted with other things, personalities, whatever. So the goal of this is to say, hey, we know that's going to be out there. But these are some issues that are important to our state for moving forward, and we need to have a conversation about them and put some focus on and them. Say what we've seen from the governor's race so far, which has not been a great deal, that will ramp up in the coming weeks. Yeah. But so far, it has simply been rhetoric and there's been really no substance to it. So how do you actually get the candidates to talk about the real issues and not just the rhetoric? Right, and that's what we're trying to cut through. I mean, we expect a certain amount of that. That's just par for the course. But we feel like with some other groups out there, our group cable, PAR, Public Affairs Research Council, and Committee of 100, we're all nonpartisan groups. We don't endorse candidates or do anything like that. Maybe that gives us a platform to be able to say, hey, these issues are important. We're not telling you exactly what to do. We've got some ideas, but we want to hear what, what you think about them and what are you going to do if you get elected? Well, one thing that we have seen over the recent years and, and before before that is our state consistently ranks last. We've mentioned exactly. that and we're tired of that. And why do we have to be in that place? So this is one place where if some of these policies could be changed moving forward, well, we can change some of those numbers. Absolutely. The, the, the policy areas that we've chosen to kind of look at, and, and look, there are more of them out there than that, but these are ones where we feel like we can move the needle. Some of them are long-term, but definitely some, a number of them are very much short-term. We can make changes that actually move us up in rankings in a short period of time if we choose to really focus and address some of these issues. All right, let's look at some of the ones that you have mentioned. Uh, education, for example. Sure. How do we move the needle there? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Number one, we're focused focusing on early childhood. That's a long-term thing in some regards, but on another thing, it's a very immediate uh, issue because it's also a workforce issue. A lot of working families have small children, they need childcare, they need quality settings. So while we may take a long-term look at what happens to those children, for those families who are working, it's a very immediate impact and one that I think can be very positive. On the other front on education, we're also talking about our adult uh, folks who are in the workforce. They don't have the skills they need to really um, get the higher paying jobs, higher wage jobs that are out there. What we're talking about is trying to take a lot of those adults who are out there that don't have enough credentials, get them back into school quickly, and then go back into the workforce at higher wages. What about fiscal policy? Well, we have a lot we can think about there, obviously. Uh, we have tax policies, basically, that are not competitive with other states. Um, there are things that we've talked about in the last few years that we haven't done, but without getting into a discussion about raising taxes, lowering taxes, we can do things structurally that make us more competitive, make us uh, stand out more positively compared to other states around us. Infrastructure. Now, this is one area that we have heard a lot about, but we're also sort of years away from being where we need to be. 
that's one where obviously it's going to take some investment. Some of these other things we're talking about making priorities, but here it's going to take some investment. But we have not adjusted our gasoline fuel taxes in 30 years. Just about every other state in the country, including the ones around us, yes. have. Yeah. So we are far behind, and we've got some you know, very large projects that we know are about statewide that, that people feel like need to be addressed. And criminal justice? We've taken some very positive steps there over the last couple of years, but we haven't implemented all the policies that we have put in place so far. So what we're saying is we've seen some very positive results on the criminal justice reforms that we have put in place, but we need to stick with them. We need to kind of tweak them if necessary, but we need to build on them and make sure that they really kind of are implemented with fidelity. When you get into the conversation with candidates and beyond just the governor's race, I mean, we're candidates at all levels and a changing legislature. How do you actually get these conversations to be heard and try to make something happen from them? We know it's actually been kind of refreshing. We have talked to uh, more than 90 uh, candidates for the legislature, and mostly these are new people, not the incumbents, the legislators. These are new people who are running because of term limits. And the feedback has been very positive. One of the things we found out is they just don't really know about a lot of these things. They, they have some ideas about what they hear. They, they hear things at the water fountain and things like that. But sometimes these issues are a little bit more complicated, or there's some, some context that they're not aware of. So we've been able to provide them some of that, and, and really the feedback has been good. Okay, Barry, thanks so much for joining us. All right, glad to be Appreciate here. It. After nearly a half century in the Louisiana legislature, John Alario Jr. has decided not to run for a House seat when his current state Senate term ends. So what now for the 75-year-old career lawmaker? The year was 1972 and John Alario Jr. of West Wego was just beginning what would be a nearly five decade long career in politics. Did you ever think you'd be here this long? No, when, when I came here I was 28 years old and a uh, matter of fact when I voted for term limits at the time, uh, we extended it for three more terms from that point. So, oh, well that's, that's about all I'm gonna think. Well, lo and behold, I ended up going to the Senate spent that time and now we hit the end of that time. Senator Olerio says he was inspired to begin his life of public service by a family member. I had an uncle who had served uh, actually 32 years on the West Wego City Council. We were very close and, and it's a small, West Wego is a small city, but uh, he was very active and very well thought of in the community. Uh, and so I, he and I would talk often about uh, politics. Term limits do prevent the 75-year-old dean of the Louisiana legislature from running for his Senate seat again. The Constitution does provide it could go back to the House of Representatives, but I thought after 48 years it might be time to try to spend whatever time I have on earth with my family. He says he gave it a lot of thought, but... I'll take a little deep breath about it. I've got uh, a special needs child who lives with me. Uh, my wife passed away about 14 years ago, so I'm very concerned about her well-being and what happens to her. I have seven grandchildren that I've, I've uh, I missed a lot of opportunities with them as I miss with my children all the time I've served. I kind of missed during the summers with my own children, uh, uh, t-ball and snowballs uh, during that time because of the amount of time it takes to serve in the legislature. Senate President Alario, now in his third term as the state senator of District 8, was chosen by fellow lawmakers as Senate President for the second consecutive term. He had previously served nine terms in the House of Representatives, including two terms as Speaker of the House, and is the first Louisiana legislator to serve as Speaker of the House twice and also be named President of the Senate twice. He said, he's very proud of his many accomplishments while in public office, both big and small. There's a lot of satisfaction in public service when you're able to help people who maybe have a difficult thing. It may seem like not a big problem to those of us in public service, but to that individual, that's the biggest thing in their life. And sometimes when you're able to help them solve their, their problems, it, it's a real good feeling and, and I enjoy doing it. His hometown benefited from one of the first bills he passed. At the time, uh, my community wasn't thought of uh, uh, very highly because we were a, a seafood processing area. Uh, shrimp boats would come into the harbor we had there. Uh, we had some shrimp factories and uh, before they realized how bad the pollution would be, they would throw the shrimp shells in the bayou, which was a dead end bayou. Well, one of the first things uh, I got to do when I was elected to the legislature was to build a pipeline from those uh, factories to the Mississippi River so that that uh, uh, waste would end up uh, going through the river. But through the years, many other measures he supported would help change the landscape of the Bayou State. When I look back, I think when I first got started, uh, 
probably helping uh, bring some funds to special education. Uh, God made sure I understood with, with uh, special education needs were. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I have a daughter with, with some special needs, so I had a little bit of understanding of it. There was a time when we would send children with, with uh, unusual needs to Texas to be housed and, and cared for there. Uh, we fought hard, several of us in the legislature, to get some additional funding for that. And since then, things have changed and we now uh, take care of our own. The waiver programs we're able to fund now uh, is helping a lot of those children uh, take care of uh, their needs once their parents are gone or their siblings are gone uh, to make sure that they do have a full life. Senator Olario is also proud of his role in establishing the Revenue Estimating Conference. There was a time when we, if we needed to balance the budget, we'd say, okay, let's raise the price all 50 cents a, a barrel and, and, and that would take care of it. Uh, now we have uh, at least some uh, professional people looking at those numbers to try to help us find it. Another bill he supported limited the amount of bonds the state could issue. It's kind of like you going out and, and keep buying different houses and having to pay different mortgages. Uh, the state was in that same posture and we weren't controlling that. Uh, we finally got a limit on it now, uh, where at least we've got to know, know where we're going with it. He says he would grade his final session an A. I thought we finished on, on a high. Uh, giving teachers a, a pay raise for the first time in a long, long time was a plus. Uh, giving additional funding to higher education. We had run through a, a series of, of mid-year budget cuts for higher education. That was devastating. Uh, to them to imagine the uh, university president having his budget all lined up, hired teachers, hired professors, and all of a sudden don't have the money to pay them uh, to make a decision what to do. I think if Louisiana has a future, it's in education, and I think the more money we can put in. So I'm so pleased that we were able to do something in elementary and secondary education, give those teachers a period. I hope that's not the end of it. I hope we keep working towards them. Uh, the fact that we end up this year with a surplus means that there may be a future in, in trying to help some more. He says he is disappointed about how some things have changed over the years, namely partisanship. So many decisions, he says, made strictly along party lines. And as the time went on, uh, it, it, we kept getting more and more division. Uh, I, I think you ought to look at issues and not party. Um, that's the biggest thing I find now, that people seem to want to be more partisan and, and think they need to dig in for one reason or another. Democracy is built on if, if you listen to me for a while, you find out that my ideas are not quite as bad. And if I listen to you for a while, I find that your ideas are not as bad. And we put those together and we make it work. And that's, I think that's the good gumbo that makes a, a democracy work. The longtime senator says he believes the state is moving in the right direction. I think finally we've got the finances stable. Uh, they need to be careful in, in the coming year not to, not to get into too much uh, extra spending, uh, take, take that time, go a little slow. Senator Olario credits Governor John Bell Edwards' efforts to help those in our state to get and keep health care. Uh, I think the fact that uh, uh, this governor uh, reached out and, and tried to bring on the Affordable Care Act to, to make sure that uh, some 450,000 people who needed the help are getting it, um, there are those who criticize that for whatever reason, if you're treating people, a preventive care that saves the state money in the long run. They don't have to be in a hospital for long periods of time. And, and so it just made sense. But I'm a little disappointed in attitudes, I guess, with some people. What do you think about the state of the country as a whole? I worry a little bit about, uh, about my country as I think everybody does. I, I wish my president would uh, not do as much twittering and, and uh, do it. Uh, the old rule in, in politics and in life is if, if you're mad about something, you write a letter. Let it lay on your desk overnight, and the next morning you'll get a little more diplomatic about rewriting it. And I think that Twittering is hurting. I think people send out something quick because you're mad at the moment, and, and you say things that you, you regret later on, and then you can't pull them back. President Alario's term officially ends in January of 2020, and he says until that time, he plans to work closely with the incoming president of the Senate to assure a smooth transition. He says for those who have questions, he will only be a phone call away. When you think of Louisiana music, the sound of jazz, swamp pop, and Cajun come to mind. But did you know as early as 1796, operas were staged in a number of venues in New Orleans? Performing arts has long been an important part of our state's culture, and one Louisianian has carried that tradition around the world. Operatic tenor, Paul Groves.
the French-speaking Bayou country of southwest Louisiana, to the renowned stages of the world's leading opera houses, American tenor Paul Groves has graced audiences with an array of stellar performances. A gifted musician, Groves recognizes his family's influences on his impressive career. My whole family did music. My dad was head of the music department at McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana for many, many years. He's also the choral director. And my mother's, she was a, a public school teacher, but her whole family was involved in music. The Groves Gospel Quartet, my grandfather was in that. And my father actually, as a child, played the piano for them. So at family reunions on both sides, we, you know, we got together and sat around the piano and sang gospel songs. And we, I always did music. Now, I, I never imagined I would be a professional opera singer but I knew I would do something in the music field. Following a brief stay at his local university, Groves realized he would like to be a singer. They say that timing is everything, and for Paul, a move to Louisiana State University proved to be a matter of extremely good timing. Robert Grayson, the great teacher from LSU, and also the Metropolitan Opera soprano Martina Arroyo, they both came to teach at LSU in the same year that I arrived. So, they really, both of them took me under their wing and uh, I got a lot of inspiration from them and also a lot of practical knowledge about what it was like to be a traveling opera singer and I also got a lot of knowledge about if I was good enough to have a career because it's, it's very difficult to, as a young singer, to know if you have the talent. In the course of our first year of work together, I, I could see that there was something there and as we moved forward and he gained discipline, it was quite clear that he was going to be successful. He always fulfilled whatever was put in front of him, and again, without all the stress and drama that many people have. It wasn't long before Groves began winning competitions in the area. And although those successes here and there were gratifying, he knew it was time for another move, a move that would propel him to the world stage. I decided uh, no one was going to discover me, you know, and, and Metropolitan Opera was not going to discover me in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, so I went to Juilliard. I got into the Juilliard Opera program, and from there, I only stayed one year, and I, I won the Metropolitan Opera competition that year, and I went straight into the Metropolitan Opera the next year. So from the time I left Baton Rouge to go to New York, I made my Metropolitan Opera debut 14 months later. From that 1992 debut at the Met, Groves continued as a premier leading tenor, debuting at Italy's La Scala in 1995, and on to the Paris Opera, London's Royal Opera, the Lyon, Vienna, and Frankfurt operas. There is probably not a male singer who has better control over his instrument. He can essentially do anything he wants on virtually any day. He sings as if he was 20 years younger. He's a wonderful thinking artist with a lot of intellectual curiosity. Uh, which I love. He's always thinking about what the words mean and how to color the words and uh, how, to, how to tell the story, which is important for an opera singer. He has great qualities. You know, what, even when I go to the operas these days, I get excited about it. It's, it's the art form that I, I've had the most goosebumps. Not, in, not only on stage performing, but just viewing. When I first got to New York City, I would go to almost every night to the Metropolitan Opera and stand way up at the top at the standing room, because that's the only tickets I could afford. And I was just thrilled every night by just the sound of the unamplified human voice. Just, you know, there's something that every once in a while, it's just magic that you just, you don't get, I feel, in a lot of other art forms. Operatic tenor Paul Groves tops the list of vocalists sought by the world's greatest opera houses. And although he has lost count of the hundreds of roles and venues he has performed, he has never lost his sense of place and home. Louisiana was always home. I lived in New York for 25 years and in Europe and everywhere, but Louisiana is, is always home. You know, it's, it's hard to get the Louisiana out of, out of all of us, but one of the reasons I moved back is just for the fishing. I go fishing all the, when I'm home, I go two or three times a week. I love it, I've loved it since I was a kid, and. It's the one thing, one activity that I'm, I never lose the passion for. Mm -hmm. 
And I love singing, I love entertaining, so I'm, I'm gonna do it for as long as I can possibly do it. In the earlier centuries, New Orleans may have topped the world stages for opera. Today, places like the Grand Opera House of the South in Crawley and Opera Louisiane in Baton Rouge and the Shreveport Opera offer many performances of the highest caliber. Yes, they do. Ted L. Jones, a veteran guitar-playing lobbyist in Baton Rouge and Washington with a political lineage from Louisiana that dates back to Earl K. Long, died early Sunday, heart failure at his home in Baton Rouge. Jones spent a lifetime enjoying his twin loves, Louisiana politics and bluegrass country music. Jones was honored as a Louisiana LPB legend in 2018. Ted Jones was 85 years old. And that's our show for this week, everyone. Remember, you can watch LPB anytime, anywhere you are with our brand new LPB app. Download it for free from our app store. This upgraded version features news, public affairs, documentaries, how-tos, and many more programs. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For all of us at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.